Gresham College presents St Paul's at 300, Lecture 2, by Martin Stancliffe. A good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mark Oakley, and I'm the Canon Treasurer of St Paul's Cathedral, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the second of two lectures given by the 17th Surveyor to the Fabric of St Paul's Cathedral, Martin Stancliffe. <coughs> It's a fine title, Surveyor to the Fabric, and it conjures up thoughts of 18th century powdered wigs, crisply rolled charts and measuring rods, all of which I have to say I think would suit Martin very handsomely indeed. <laughs> Martin Stancliffe is a model surveyor, but for me, I will always think of him as friend to the fabric of St. Paul's Cathedral. Because if you look back over his 21 years at the cathedral, that is one fifteenth of the present cathedral's life, if you look back over that time, what you see is that Martin befriended it. The cathedral as working church and as building. And like all good friends do, to those for whom they have great affection. He accepted it for what it is, but he kept looking out for how to develop potential, how to correct the odd fault, how to help it be more accessible, more purposeful, how to keep it beautiful. The Germans have a great word, Schlimmbesserung. It means an improvement that makes things worse. <laughs> And you'll probably be able to think of many instances in life at the moment where that word can be used, but it can't ever be used of Martin, as I think you will see tonight. I actually think that a good priest and a good architect have something in common. They both pursue not so much what is relevant as what is resonant. That space, tempo, material, beauty, that speaks of more than novelty and the passing fad. Both, it seems to me, are concerned for what might enrich and help shape what we call the human soul. The inner landscape and the outer landscape seem to me to be in constant communication. Some of you heard last week my colleague, Michael Colclough, talking about the skills that Martin has brought to his work as surveyor and as I say, friend, and just how much those professional skills are admired. But tonight, I just wanted to honor Martin not only for what he has done, but also for who he is, and how that has energized, and how that has informed all that he has achieved. He is patiently passionate. He's as keen, let me tell you, sometimes as a puppy Labrador and yet he is never hasty, always able to see how every deck of the St. Paul's ship connects, and he has a very nice dose of dry irony, which, let me tell you, is essential in anyone working with clergy day to day. <clears throat> he has been, as I say, that great friend to the building, but he's also a great friend to those of us who work there, and the many colleagues that are surveyor must work with also in the city and beyond. He's been a marvelous ambassador for the cathedral and we are really very proud of him. And now you will see why. For in this second lecture, you will see for yourself how Martin as surveyor became that distinguished loving friend to St. Paul's over his time in office. And consequently allowed thousands and thousands of others to befriend it too as they discovered it afresh through his work. So, ladies and gentlemen, Martin Stancliffe. Well, thank you very much. I'm not sure what I can live up to that, really, but um, uh, here goes, anyway. Um, I'm aware that I left you with a few cliffhangers last week, um, and I hope that we can address at least some of them uh, this week. Uh, 
I found when I was putting this second lecture together that I had to leave out at least as much as I have left in, uh, probably very much more so than that, um, because this account can only be a very partial one of what I've done uh, over the past 21 years. Um, I just want to say, first of all, uh, that it's far from all being down to me. Um, and I do just, at this uh, outset, just want to pay tribute uh, to a few members of my team that have worked with me now for 21 or so years. Um, Ulrika Knox, Chris Cotton and Emma Hardesty in my office have been tires of strength. Robert Bowles, the structural engineer, and Jeff Evans, the quantity surveyor, have also been hugely important to everything that we've done. And to Martin Fletcher, the clerk of the works and the cathedral works department, I think I can say um, that we would done a, not have done anything uh, if uh, it hadn't been for their support and ability. Uh, a great thank you, too, to the Fabric Advisory Committee. There are three members of the uh, committee uh, that have been with us all the way from 1990 onwards. And that's fantastic that they've stayed the course. And of course, a thank you to successive deans and chapters. Um, the list of uh, all the consultants, fellow professionals, contractors, craftsmen, and craftswomen, uh, actually I, I have prepared, and it runs to about four or five pages of tightly uh, written text. Um, it's been a huge operation, everything that we've done. Uh, and uh, that one can't do everything one, by oneself. So it's been a privilege to lead such an extraordinary team. Right. Um, it doesn't seem to go on to the next slide, which may mean that we're going to be here for a little while. Um, these were the issues that we looked at last week, um, and I'm not going to go through them, through them again, um, but I hope to be able to address at least partially uh, some of the cliffhangers that I left you with. Um, first of all, uh, the issue of the south transept and indeed of the uh, structure as a whole. As I told you last week, it was handed on to me by my predecessors as a, as a potentially major problem. Um, and I. Uh, found out soon enough that I needed to re review the monitoring programs that I described last week and were in process still as I arrived in 1990. I felt that th what they were doing was showing that the building was actually extremely stable, uh, but it was, is a world-famous monitoring system, and I didn't wish to set that aside lightly. Uh, so I took uh, quite a lot of advice uh, around the place, and eventually the Dean and Chapter uh, agreed with me that we should appoint a new uh, set of engineers, and in appointing, appointing Alan Baxter, and in particular, though we didn't know it then, uh, appointing his, uh, his assistant, uh, Robert Bowles, uh, I believe that we took, made a very, very um, safe mood, move. They made a complete a reappraisal of the structural systems uh, of the cathedral and produced an, an important three-volume document which actually sets out again the status quo uh, from the cathedral as a whole. I can't go into the detail of all of that, but I do want to just uh, tell you what happened in the south transept. Here is the south transept, um, and here was a drawing that uh, took, formed part of the fat two-volume report which we put together as a preliminary to doing any work. I'm a great believer in, in analysis of problems before you plunging into them, and I found Robert Bowles to be a similar uh, mentality. Uh, he, too, believes in doing his homework first. And uh, these two big volumes that we produced, which are now going into the archive, uh, were very informative and very important because it showed, actually, that instead of being a mighty problem that had thought that the previous surveyors had thought would bedevil uh, the cathedral for some years, we found that, uh, if history proves us right, uh, that it isn't actually a problem at all. On the right here, you will, you will probably not be able to read a drawing that we put together, uh, which actually uh, enumerates the various structural schemes that were put in uh, at various points in the late 18th century, uh, the late 19th and early 20th centuries, uh, to try and restrain the so-called outward movement, uh, which is indicated uh, in the section on the left-hand side. But when we came to actually look at it in detail, uh, we found a few interesting things. 
And there are wonderful tools that one can now use, Photogra photogrammetry being one of them, which allows uh, an absolutely accurate cross-section to be able to be obtained. And with an absolutely accurate cross-section, you can test whether when it's straight and where it's moved to, um, where they coincide and where they don't. It's actually not a very clear slide, I'm afraid, on the left-hand side, but I don't know whether you can see the pinkish line, which shows the line of distortion against the undistorted section through the uh, transept. But the drawing on the right-hand side, one of Robert Bowles's very uh, um, instructive and simple diagrams that even a stupid architect like me can sometimes understand, shows exactly uh, what he thought had happened, and which we were able to actually test. You can actually see, I don't know whether you can see the letters A and B at the foot of the springing of the arch, and how B has slipped down relative to A, and how the arch has moved out of the true semicircle because, of course, of the settlement downwards under the weight of the dome. What happens then um, is that the, the um, uh, main thrust where the arrow is goes down. The stone which is in the middle uh, here, there, uh, with a cross on it, you can see it's twisted sideways. And it doesn't take great uh, understanding to realise that if you've got a stone there which actually twists sideways, it is actually longer from one corner to the other than it is if it's actually straight. And that's what happened. As that thing went down, so those stones twisted sideways. The dome couldn't move sideways because it's too heavy. The only thing that could move was the outer wall, which indeed moved out. That was the, what the, the solution that they posited. And actually, they were able to demonstrate that by measuring the amount that the, that the floor has sunk or the footings have sunk under each of the uh, supports of the dome, you could calculate how far the south wall would be pushed out. And actually, having measured the two and calculated them, they f we found that they actually coincided. So we feel uh, that we have uh, sussed out what actually was happening, that actually nothing is happening. And this slide, which I showed you last week, which showed Robert Potter's um, uh, special little uh, computer-aided uh, measuring points, uh, which are just on one of those stones which, as I say, has slipped sideways. Uh, we've left it in position in case it's needed to be connected up in the future, but we really don't think that anything is going to be uh, needed to be done. In fact, what we've done is we've taken out some of the uh, ironwork which was put in. We've taken out some of the ironwork that was put in by uh, Robert Milne in uh, 1782, and we've taken out some of the tie rods that were put in by Summers Clark in uh, 1898. And I was a little bit nervous when we cut the tie rod as to whether there would be a mighty ping. But fortunately, I'm here still. Uh, there wasn't. I showed you this slide also last week, uh, which I took, as I said, um, when I started my inspection of the fabric um, in 1990. I looked up and saw this large chunk of stone uh, coming out of the... Um, uh, in entablature of the peristyle and wondered what on earth was going on. It's a long way up. We got a, an emergency scaffolding up <coughs> and what I saw on the right hand side didn't encourage me greatly that not only were the bits missing but there were clearly many more bits about to be missing uh, given a little more pressure. So we started an exploratory program uh, which proved to be quite an investigative uh, conundrum. As you can see on the left-hand side, somebody has obviously been up here before, um, because you can see that there are already some stones that have been uh, pieced in. And so we, so we found that somebody had indeed been there before. Uh, you don't want to open up bits of the fabric that are quite so far up in the air too easily and too uh, blithely without support from below. So we actually um, went very gradually into the problem. Uh, but the problem which concerned me was how did this bit of the cathedral actually work? How is it constructed? And how is it that these blocks here, this block here, which you see has straight vertical joints, how is it that it doesn't just drop vertically downwards? Um, which obviously it doesn't. The answer is in this um, rather complicated diagram, which I could take you through, but we'd be here for a quarter of an hour if I did so. 
So I think all that I can say here is to say that this is the fruit of an investigative program which took us several months to suss out, uh, that we found there were all sorts of things going on here, including a hidden row of arches, which were undoubtedly used by Wren in order to be able to get the blocks in in the first place and, in fact, level them up all the way around uh, the dome. And you must remember that there were four different contractors working each on a segment of the, of the uh, dome, and they all had to meet one another on a level. Uh, so the ingenious architect actually got a system in place whereby they could do that. We therefore were able to open up uh, a little more bravely once we'd understood actually how it works. And there you can see these hidden arches uh, which go all the way around. And um, just by this pot of um, paint, there's, there's actually a, one of the hangers which allows the lower stones to be adjusted up or down uh, to level it uh, on the completion of the installation. Also, you will see that there's a great iron chain going right round, and that is, of course, what um, it was causing the stones to split away, had caused the stones to split away, we discovered in 1904, 1905, when Summers Clark was up there before, but left no records, he just records that he did repair work there, um, and which we had to address. The slightly lurid, lurid orange um, is because it's an, there's a, the, um, the technique we used to, to uh, uh, address the arm was one which we noticed that he had used before and we thought it was rather a good idea. Um, we used uh, red lead um, in, a, in a, um, a, a lead putty, uh, rather like a, um, a um, glazier's putty, uh, to clad the arm work of the chain. And replacing the stonework um, around that, where it had been split and fractured, uh, was a very tricky business indeed. Um, I, I remind you that we're 200 feet up in the air. We're dealing with blocks of stone which sometimes were weighing, uh, approaching a ton, uh, that had to be jigsaw puzzled into place. Uh, so that the whole thing was structurally stable still. None of us uh, felt that it was quite right, the right thing to do to uh, cut the chain in case there was a mighty ping. Uh, so we didn't do that. Uh, but you can get perhaps some idea of the complexity of the work um, from these two slides. The work took about five or six years. By the time we'd worked out what we were trying to do, and we had then worked all the way around the peristyle, because the same fault occurs uh, all the way around and was occurring all the way around. Um, so it took us a great deal of time. While we were doing it, uh, we took the opportunity to clean the stonework. And that, in a way, kind of set a precedent for what was the, then the major work that was remaining to be done, which was to address the stonework of the entire exterior of the cathedral. You will remember the black, blackened photographs that I showed you last week. The cleaning process itself um, looks a bit frightening, with the chap on the left blasting some terrible substance at the stone. Um, in fact, the blast is under uh, 40 psi, so it's a pretty low kind of uh, um, uh, blast, and there's a very small amount of aggregate in it, and what actually is coming out of the end of the tube is a sort of spray of water, only one or two litres uh, a minute were, were used, so that the amount of water on the surface of the stone was not very great. It's a very soft and gentle technique, um, but of course you have to be kitted up uh, to, uh, to, to actually do it. And on the right-hand side, of course, the great uh, majority of the value of the work has been to try and make the whole stonework external surface as watertight as possible, which has involved a lot of extremely patient pointing, as you can see on the right-hand side. Last week, we looked at the effects of stone erosion, um, and we looked at those two um, pictures on the right-hand side of the similar mouldings, one, one eroded and, and one not eroded. Um, I explained that with the figure sculptures, we decided that we wouldn't do anything about them, that we actually have uh, digitally scanned them in three dimensions so that in a number of years' time, they could be re-scanned and we could actually map where the, where the losses, if any, uh, were occurring. But that's something for my successor or possibly even his successor uh, to look at. 
But we were worried about uh, the effects <coughs> of continued weathering on weathering surfaces. And the major cornices, which had been asphalted uh, by Summers Clark in the early years of the 20th century, had completely um, cracked and had pulled away from the leading edges. The leading edges were therefore actually very thin and very um, uh, um, uh, indented, uh, so that they were in great danger of actually channeling water down specific routes. So we evolved this um, particular little detail of a little lead strip uh, that runs along the edge that projects out and throws the water off and is then tucked into the asphalt underneath. And the asphalt actually runs backwards to little drainage channels at the back of the cornice that run down the internal rainwater pipes. I, I didn't dream that one up. That was dreamt up by Summers Clark, and we um, uh, replaced it all. The effect when you look up from below is that we can actually keep all those um, leading edges, which are actually wonderful, great, huge, sound stones that were actually just wearing at their most exposed edges. Um, and by just putting that little black line, which you can probably just see here, uh, we've managed to keep uh, all the, the stone of that particular weathering uh, uh, all around the cathedral at both levels, both upper and lower. And that contrasts with what was being done um, in the 1970s and 80s, where a huge amount of new stone was actually being put into those cornices, to my way of thinking, quite unnecessarily, and indeed damagingly, because we all love the slightly worn stones that fit in with the rest of the cathedral. The end result is, of course, homogeneity as much as anything else. Um, and it's taken, as I say, from 1994 to 2011 uh, to get round the whole thing peristyle and then right round the entire cathedral. I originally actually thought that it would take 25 years, so I want to say a big thank you to the donors who actually made this possible by producing the substantial sums of money that it, that it takes to get there. And I say to get there because, of course, a dishearteningly a large amount of that money goes into the scaffolding to get you up there and get you back down again. But I hope you agree that the exterior has now been transformed. It's not blindingly clean, and it never will be, and in my view, never should be, but it's homogeneous. The Great West Steps, which are in the front of that picture, um, were replacements um, from 1875, which F.C. Penrose uh, put in uh, using blue Guernsey granite to replace the uh, black Irish marble which Wren had used and which had entirely decayed. And you can see that when they were taken away, well, you can see on the left-hand side that they were all displaced. Um, they were getting rocky, they were beginning to move, um, and they were uneven. Um, when, you, when we took them off, as you can see on the right-hand side, they were just kind of balanced on a, on a curious um, uh, substructure, uh, composed largely of a material called trass, which is a very interesting mixture of uh, volcanic ash and lime, uh, to make uh, what Wren believed was, uh, and without, with, with good reason, uh, to be a good waterproof substance. Uh, but the steps, as I say, were moving, and they were letting in water at an alarming rate, and so we felt that the right thing to do was to address it as a complete issue. It did involve taking them to completely to pieces and putting them back together again, and that was a task that was made um, a little bit more challenging uh, because of the way that they were set out by Penrose. These are not the steps that actually Wren designed. Um, he had a different Great West uh, staircase, and, and Penrose actually redesigned it in a completely different way in the mid-1870s. Penrose was not the first person to notice entasis uh, on the Parthenon in Athens, um, the, 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 the absence of any straight lines within the architectural layout. Um, that had first been observed by another surveyor to the fabric of St. Paul's Cathedral, Charles Cockerell, a generation before. But Penrose was the first person actually to measure the Parthenon absolutely accurate. And he measured to a, th and a thousandth of an inch of tolerance, which is pretty good going, I reckon. 
Um, and in these steps, he laid them out with an emphasis, which I, I hope you can see from this photograph. I took it with a, so that with a bit of luck you can see that they are actually curved like that. Uh, we had to take all that to pieces, and we then had to put it all the way back again. And uh, fortunately, we had a very good contractor who was able to do that. Turning now to the interior, and just to remind you of this rather blank um, slide, which I showed you too many times last, last week for comfort, um, and to the slide which indicates how the interior of the cathedral was arranged for worship on a normal day-by-day uh, -day basis. It's like a big parish church with a kind of nave going up to a chancel screen with the choir um, in their choir stalls and a great high altar up at, up at the end. The choir loved being in there, of course. It's nice and cosy with velvet cushions, um, but it doesn't actually project the sound out very much. On big occasions, uh, diocesan occasions like this, uh, the dean and chapter kind of rigged up a, a, a camp uh, they didn't know in those days that camps were what one did at St Paul's. Um, uh, and they put up these rather sort of uh, ramshackle um, platforms with old bits of frilly carpet round the edge. Um, and uh, when you think that that's the Bishop of London, the, and indeed I think the Archbishop of Canterbury is sitting on there, um, you, you will realise that I didn't feel that this was something that I could live with um, for very long. And I did a drawing... Um, which actually replicates very closely the Micklethwaite drawing, which, if you remember, I showed you last week. Um, I didn't know about the Micklethwaite drawing in those days, but we were both on the same track, and that is that if you've got an altar there, there are more people who can see it from closer if you put it there and go to a fan shape that comes out in this direction than if you have it up here, where the only people can see can see are actually down the nave and they're kind of 300 feet away. Um, so we were all on the same lines and I persuaded the Dean and Chapter that it was worth doing a mock-up. I'm a great believer in mock-ups and we built this out of MDF and veneer um, and we put it up for a whole liturgical sequence from Easter to Christmas, through to Christmas. And I think, actually, if I hadn't gone on badgering them, the Dean and Chapter would have not noticed that it was a mock-up and thought that it was perfectly all right forever. But eventually, I did persuade them that it wasn't worthy enough. And we actually had um, the dais, which is there at the moment, made um, out of beautiful materials, as well crafted as I could manage, uh, because I think that it will be there uh, for a good length of time. I certainly hope so. Uh, but it is just placed on the floor uh, so that when liturgical fashions change, and we all know how liturgical fashions change, uh, it can all be taken away again, uh, and the floor will be there happily underneath. It is actually designed in such a way that it can come to pieces. Um, it would take two or three days to take to pieces and probably about a fortnight to put back, back together again. But it's made in, in sections because that's what the Dean and Chapter required me to do. I think, fortunately, they've forgotten um, that it t takes to pieces because it's never needed to be taken to pieces uh, since then. And the end result um, is something which... Um, adds a, a real dignity and sense of community to these major services under, under, the, under the dome. And we're now working on the furniture for the choir here, still on temporary uh, um, seats up, up in the top of the picture. And a mock-up has been in place for a number of months, uh, testing that. And indeed, I rather hope that the Dean and Chapter don't forget that that is a mock-up too, and that one day that it needs to be replaced by a more worthy piece of furniture. But the end result has been that the sense of community around the new central altar under the dome, dome um, has been... Uh, has formed the key to what Dean Moses, Dean John Moses, who came to the cathedral in 1996 um, and inspired a great deal of the work that has been carrying on until very recently. And he was very anxious to enable the building to speak of faith uh, in his words. And so he and I worked together to, uh, to try and install a kind of paradigm of the spiritual journey so that in the center, the people of God are gathered around the altar in the center of the building as an image of the church on earth. And the high altar then in the far distance becomes, if you like, a transcendental image of the life beyond. 
But of course, that, that p- pilgrimage of faith uh, required a starting point. Wren didn't actually provide a, a font for the cathedral. It was only provided after his death by Francis Bird, beautiful piece. Um, it has a, um, a top, a marble top, weighing a number of tons and uh, no means of taking it off. Um, so it's not altogether surprising that it um, actually wasn't used very often um, <laughs> in the first 160 years of its life. And it's then been something of a, of a refugee in different corners of the cathedral, here on the left where I, uh, I found it when I took over in 1990. We, I got a, um, a clever sculptor to uh, make a, 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 an exact um, life-size mock-up of it in polystyrene. There you can see on the upper right uh, the, uh, the, the expression on the faces of the visitors when the members of the works department carried it single-handedly down the, <laughs> down the nave were a reward enough in themselves. But we did another mock-up at the west end of the nave to see whether it actually looked the right kind of scale there if we took the lid off. Uh, We have the lid safely upstairs, where we hope to put it on display soon, but we've decided that actually it should be on a proper uh, dais, uh, in a proper permanent way, uh, at the west end. And in that position, if you like, it forms the completion of this this, paradigm of faith as a processional route uh, from baptism and initiation through to transfiguration uh, at the extreme uh, east end. It's simple, but it needs to be in a place like St. Paul's, or it isn't clear. And the space under the dome, of course, gets used for all sorts of things. Here's uh, Mahler's Symphony of a Thousand, um, and I counted them, and there weren't quite a thousand, but there jolly nearly were, um, uh, on the left-hand side. And I asked the liturgical department to send me a photograph of what they thought was a good liturgical um, uh, event. And they sent me this slightly surprising photograph. Uh, I didn't expect it quite to be what what they showed me, but it it demonstrates um, uh, how... uh, how usable um, this amazing space is as, uh, for a piece of liturgical theatre. But of course, the use of this particular area uh, requires um, some stage managing, uh, because the popular night for concerts uh, is a Saturday night, and by Sunday morning early, the cathedral has to be back again in its normal configuration. So I put... Um, It's probably difficult for you to see, but I put a crane in there. It's like a sort of derrick for luring lifeboats from a a liner. And it swings out, and behind it you can see packed there on pallets all the the, um, decking uh, that forms the the, uh, the platform uh, for concerts below. And it can be dropped down erected, and then after the performance, uh, it can be all lifted up again straight to its storage place. St Paul's is a a big and monumental place, and there aren't really enough points of focus for quiet, quiet, prayerful reflection. This famous picture by uh, Holman Hunt, The Light of the World, um, hung in the south nave aisle um, until... Uh, Princess Diana's death, when suddenly it became the centre of an enormous uh, pile of flowers and uh, mixed with the flowers and around them uh, lots and lots and lots of candles. Uh, Visitors were always bumping into them and we nearly burnt the place down uh, with the conflagration which could easily have um, happened. But it drew attention particularly to something about the quality of this picture uh, which does focus attention. And I have reset it um, as an altarpiece, um, as a much more focal position um, in the Middlesex Chapel. And we've talked for many years about other points of focus. And uh, discussions have been in progress now for several years with the great American video artist Bill Viola. And he's at the... He's at present making um, two wonderful new artworks, which are going to be positioned at the end of the choir aisles um, to be installed probably at the end of next year. And the rearrangements of the uh, layout on the interior uh, have allowed uh, the cathedral 
to engage much more um, immediately with the visual arts. And these great uh, panels on the walls uh, at the entrance to the dome have become places where, from time to time, artists have been able to show work for a few months uh, to the great benefit of all. Here, this, is, this is Mark Alexander's um, Mannheim altarpiece-inspired pictures. But it's not just the great art artists, uh, uh, but the, the, the craftsman artists who I have tried to foster in everything that uh, I've done in the cathedral. Uh, we put in some great new uh, revolving west doors and the glazed panels uh, were etched uh, by Richard Kindersley with these wonderful inscriptions uh, where he's managed to make Jacob's lad ladder um, out of the um, little uh, ladder of H's that runs up um, up to the cross, cross. But it's not just the layout of the cathedral that needed to be addressed back in the early 1990s. It was the whole interior that seemed so dispiriting. I suggested actually cleaning for the millennium, and there seemed to be plenty of time from 1991 until the millennium. But of course, these things take a lot of preparation and research. And there were very many more important things that we needed to be done first. And the preparation and research actually took us uh, right up till the year 2000, uh, and we weren't able to begin the cleaning work uh, that we wanted to do until 2001. We had to do art historical research, we had to do technical research, we had to um, find out whether it was affordable or not, we had to find out whether it was practical um, and practicable in programming terms. Uh, and of course the consents you need for this kind of thing uh, are alarming in the extreme. But we did develop um, a series of tests. Here was our first little test to see what actual clean stonework might look like. And we then actually covered uh, one whole little uh, bay of the south transept to see what the effect of cleaning would be on a whole element within the church. And on the completion of that, uh, the various advisory committees were able to give their approval for us uh, to do the substantial work involved in actually undertaking the cleaning of the complete interior of the cathedral. To begin with, of course, there was dust, tons of it. Um, and then um, the uh, technique that we used, uh, which we imported from Belgium, uh, involved spraying a latex spray onto the stonework, uh, which was done at night by a special team who came over every three weeks from Belgium. Sprayed the material on, and then the latex mask, which covered the stonework, could be very simply uh, peeled off and bagged uh, for removal from the cathedral. And it then, then only needed a, a little brush with a touch of water and a sponge to actually remove the dirt completely and expose um, the, the clean stonework of the interior. And in the process of doing so, uh, expose the wonderful intricacy of the uh, carved work, which before had just been a kind of mass of black soot and completely invisible to the eye. And the end result has been a transformation to the to the interior of the cathedral. It's not only full of light, but it's actually, again, I've used this word homogeneous before, but I'm sure it has the architectural character um, that Wren uh, intended. We did leave a panel uh, behind the Great West Doors of uncleaned stone, just so that people would, could be reminded of the state of which the, the cathedral uh, was in before it was cleaned. And actually, we used it by, uh, by putting a glass inscription over it as a real thank you to the extraordinary generous donation which enabled uh, this whole project to be done. Uh, it, it, was a, it was a complete cleaning process. It wasn't just the stonework. Uh, here is uh, Nelson's monument being gently steam cleaned. But it was the Thornhill Dome high above which was the big challenge. Uh, when you're standing on the floor and you've got to specify what the conservator is going to do when he gets up there on his expensive uh, scaffolding, uh, it doesn't half cause you to think. Um, of course, people had been there before. E.T. 
E.T. Paris uh, did an amazing job between 1853 and 1856. I think this illustration from the Illustrated London News at the time perhaps slightly over glamorizes it. it but he does, it does make the point that um, health and safety issues are um, slightly more rigorous than they were perhaps uh, in those days. He completely um, repainted single-handedly the bottom 20 feet of the entire dome all the way round. We needed rather safer scaffolding to get there, but we needed to keep the dome visible because public access to the Whispering Gallery um, is an important uh, money spinner for the, for the Dean and Chapter throughout, and uh, we couldn't close it all. And we also needed to be able to monitor the appearance as we worked. So I had this um, dotty idea, as architects do, of, uh, of hanging a scaffolding from the top of the lantern by a cable so that it could actually rotate and the poor engineers and scaffolding designers uh, had to try and make it work, which, to give them their credit, they did eventually. And when we got up there, here are the two, conservator, two of the conservator team, just um, sort of slightly mind-boggled, I think, at the, at the scale of what they were having to, to take on, because it is a substantial area when you get there. We discovered all sorts of interesting things, which I can't possibly go into now, but one of them is that it was well known that E.T. Paris had repainted the bottom 20 feet all the way around. What, isn't, uh, what hadn't been known was that he actually scraped all the plaster off uh, completely back to the brickwork, replastered it, and then put the whole thing uh, painting back on again. Um, and this is the point of, of the junction between the two. And you probably can't see where, from where you are, but this bottom bit has a sort of sandy finish. And the top bit, uh, which is the Thornhill bit, has a much oilier finish on the smoother, smoother plaster. And you can get some idea of the loose paint, flaking paintwork, uh, which the conservators had to stabilize and deal with. We didn't, of course, know what, to what degree of cleanliness we were able to get the painted surface until we got up there. Um, and that was where the ability to move the scaffold allowed us to do initial areas, move the scaffold out of the way, and then stand back and actually see uh, how we could uh, marry the cleaned area of the uh, painting above down to the stonework which we were cleaning below. And of course, as often, we discovered all sorts of interesting things. Uh, for instance, this self-portrait of Thornhill uh, wasn't known before and was a good discovery um, to make. And Thornhill signed his name uh, in this seal here on one of the magic books which are being burned, Thornhill 1720. And E.T. Paris had put his um, uh, name and date there. So we thought we'd be cheeky and add ours, uh, because it's interesting to find there. So um, that's the one place where I appear in the cathedral, and you need a quite powerful pair of binoculars to be able to see it from below. What, hadn't, what I hadn't realised was that the so-called timber, the area above the Whispering Gallery and below the bottom of the dome, had been completely painted out in 1859 in, in um, a stone-coloured paint, and that Thornhill's decorative scheme, had been which had been in that area, had been completely forgotten. But in this photograph, um, you may just be able to see, just grinning through the, state, the stonework, the actual shadow of the... Uh, underpainted fluting uh, of the original Thornhill scheme below. We then did an excavation uh, of that. We patiently scraped off the upper layer of paint to uh, reveal the details of that scheme below. To have actually by scalpel removed the whole thing would have taken years and years and been cost millions of pounds and probably it would have been very damaged. So in the end we got consent to put an archaeological separating layer over this, over this paintwork and we completely reconstructed the whole thing on the top. Here's Charles Hesp, wonderful painter, uh, who um, repainted the whole thing using, I should say, the materials uh, the, of, the, of the time. We researched very carefully the exact pigments and the exact techniques that would have been used so that he could replicate them. And we were then able to move um, the scaffolding out of the way to allow us to see the effect from, the, from below and adjust it uh, depending on how we, we felt about it. And then in the end, the overall result when we got the scaffolding out of the way was to unify the dome back 
as it had been originally intended, uh, making the timber part of the overall design of the dome and therefore stopping it being a kind of separate uh, issue, uh, which it was before. I mentioned last week that we found all sorts of interesting things while we were cleaning, which we've recorded as best we can. Uh, and here is a typical page showing uh, samples of the areas that have been repainted uh, with new designs in the second half of the 19th century, which I alluded to uh, last week. There are also the great mosaics of the pendentives below the Whispering Gallery. Um, there are eight of them. Uh, we did numbers one to seven quite satisfactorily, moving round uh, one by one. Um, and of course, as luck would have it, number eight proved to be entirely loose. You could push it and it would go in and out. And it's just above where the bishop sits. Um, so we thought probably we ought to make it a little bit more secure. And so this whole um, pendentive of St. Mark uh, was taken down to, uh, um, taken away to the workshops uh, and consolidated and brought back and put back up again. A mighty, I, I mean, it's as high as up to the springing of the, um, Vault, uh, of the roof of this room, if not higher. It's a huge piece. We always anticipated that transformation of the interior would able, enable a new lighting system to be developed, which would use less power because of the greater reflectivity of the clean stonework. And um, I took the bit uh, between my teeth and actually suggested that we hang a great series of wonderful chandeliers down the nave. The, previously, the, the, the lighting system of the 19. Uh, 50s had involved hidden lights all over the place. Um, but these great chandeliers um, add something very particular to the space as a whole. Uh, they're very controllable, they're all on dimmers, uh, so that they can be turned right down and left on using very little um, power, um, even when the, the building is quite well lit and add a, adds a wonderful glow to the whole. Then there was an issue which came along about 12 years ago, which we hadn't anticipated. And that was the um, effects of the uh, Equality Act, um, which of course says that it's illegal for any uh, building, uh, for, for any uh, own, building owner not to make um, adequate um, provision uh, for equality of access. Uh, to the church. We had uh, a major report done which uh, used the memorable words um, that the West Steps formed a formidable obstacle to anybody who, who couldn't easily manage st stairs. We thought of all sorts of ways uh, that we might overcome that, all of which were totally disastrous and all of which had to be set aside. There were some easy things that could be done, like putting in handrails, as on the left, and putting in stone nosings uh, for the poor, poorly sighted on the right. But the bigger problem was how on earth to get people in wheelchairs more effectively into the cathedral. On the south side, the southwest churchyard, um, had been planted up in the 1970s uh, by perhaps a rather enthusiastic Parks and Gardens Department of the Corporation of London, uh, and had developed into a, a rather sort of outsized um, herbaceous border of trees, which were very beautiful to look at, but didn't allow you to see the cathedral very much. In addition, as you can see on the left-hand side, there were no railings around the cathedral. They had been taken away. Um, we actually were able to trace them uh, to a yard in Ashford where they had been uh, languishing. Uh, people at the cathedral had completely forgotten that they existed. I didn't know that they existed. And it was only by research that we discovered that they had been lovingly taken out, were lovingly being stored, uh, and the, the contractors were puzzled as to why they weren't being asked to put them back again. So we arranged to put them back again, as you can see, on the right-hand side, but we also used the opportunity to completely re-landscape uh, this whole area so as to make the door, which on the left-hand side is right behind all this uh, um, greenery, the one door which gets people into the cathedral from the churchyard level. And we did that uh, by using the uh, fact 
that beneath this churchyard lie the remains of the only parts of the great pre-fire cathedral which are actually remaining visible at ground, ground level. These are the parts of the original chapter house and its surrounding two-story cloister, the great work of William Ramsey. Um, and the details of the chapter house layout and indeed how all the particular mouldings are formed are actually now are the basis of the re-landscaped system which actually disguises the fact that it's all just a great ramp which allows you to get from one level and the pavement up to the level in the corner here where you can actually get in a wheelchair in through the door. And we commissioned Richard Kindersley to make this very beautiful uh, inlay in the pavement uh, using various different kinds of Purbeck stone which shows the relationship of Wren's Cathedral and to the much bigger, longer uh, uh, original medieval uh, cathedral which preceded it. All of that got access in one kind of way, but it doesn't get access in all kinds of ways. And another way of getting access um, was this, that on the right-hand side, you can see that we've put in into the crypt a uh, installation which has a 270 degree uh, projection system in it. And that immersive experience um, allows um, people uh, with specially made films um, to uh, get the experience of actually going up to the Whispering Gallery, indeed on up to the uh, Golden Gallery above, seeing the views within the dome and the view um, from the Golden Gallery above. Having got that facility in place, of course it's wonderful to be able to use it for other things like to tell in brief form something about the life of the cathedral and its history. And on the left hand side, and going with that, um, is the new timeline exhibition which has been put in. That looks very beautiful, um, and is very beautiful, but if you look at the left hand side of this, you will see that that area of um, uh, vaulting within the crypt um, has been the subject of a huge amount of work to remove, it was like being under, in a submarine. Um, all the pipework and cabling ran at high level in the crypt um, and had to be taken down and put under, under the floor of the crypt, an enormous undertaking. And on the right hand side, just to remind you how blank the crypt looked 20 years ago, and in a way, it hasn't taken very much uh, to insert some screens, some new services, some various fittings, and improve the lighting to transform the crypt into an extremely lively place. That's the same view before and after. I have to say that initially the chapter were not persuaded by my ideas um, to open up the crypt. Um, because very few visited the crypt, um, because you had to actually, actually pay to go down. But I pointed out that if you put the WCs in the crypt, um, it would ensure that nearly every visitor goes down, and so it has proved. And as a result, uh, the uh, centre of the crypt, as well as being a very busy and sociable place, um, has actually been able to be transformed uh, to um, benefit the life of the cathedral in ways which I hardly began to dare uh, think possible when I started on the, on the drawings. Uh, we've squeezed a great deal of additional uh, space in, which you can't see when you're in the crypt, uh, by, by getting uh, mezzanine levels in uh, wherever we can. So there are two stories uh, in many parts of the crypt. And that's enabled us to have not only the shop here on the left, the cafe down at the end, a refectory, um, a conference suite, but also staff restrooms and common rooms, a completely new education department, a completely new set of choir practice rooms with several different rooms, and new entrances from the Undercroft, as well as the Oculus uh, um, exhibition, which I showed you a minute ago. And that has transformed uh, the life of the crypt, and it has also transformed much of the life of the cathedral to have those facilities uh, down there. And the furniture and the details are important too. I designed these big benches um, uh, to look as though they might have been there for a, for a bit. But you will notice that they've got wonderful flat wide arms which are designed to take your trays and cups of tea from the cafe. And they work not too badly to do that. And above them you will see perhaps Richard Kindersley's beautiful inscription recording many of the significant memorials lost in the destruction of the pre-fire cathedral, a beautiful piece of uh, late uh, 20th century lettering. 
The division of the crypt into three differently characterized areas has made it, in my view, all the more legible. Um, there was a great deal of pressure for a memorial to Winston Churchill on the model of the tombs of Nelson and Wellington, the great big uh, thing that would stand there. Uh, but they, of course, are their tombs, and Churchill, of course, is buried uh, not in the cathedral. And the suggestion was put forward uh, that we needed a great screen to d divide uh, the sort of national mausoleum of Wellington and Nelson from the, what the previous dean called the People's Boulevard, the, um, the, the western part of the crypt. And this fine piece of uh, contemporary metalwork uh, was eventually commissioned, and I enjoyed very much working with uh, Jim Horbin, a most wonderful craftsman in metal, in his uh, forge in Somerset. We've also lit the crypt completely anew, um, and I've chanced my arm pretty roughly with, with uh, the guides there, because I want uh, the area around Nelson to be as dim as we can possibly make it. Um, and I'm always there turning down the lights, and then I find that they get turned up a little bit. Uh, but we have, I think, agreed on a good compromise now, and it's certainly the atmosphere down there um, uh, makes people behave much better, they're much more reverential, they're much quieter, and they behave generally uh, much better. Here, of course, is Nelson's great uh, tomb designed by Charles Cockerell using Robert Zane's Italian Renaissance casket as its centerpiece. And then, I'm, I'm telling you all this in the wrong order of, in terms of the order in which we did things, uh, but I referred last week to the fact that the OBE chapel didn't really work in the uh, crypt because whenever there was a service, uh, the whole crypt had to be shut because the noise disturbance was too much. So actually, the first thing that I did was to design a completely new screen uh, as acoustically uh, protected as possible. Uh, each of those um, uh, caskets up on the top is actually um, split by a piece of uh, um, acoustic glass which goes through it, um, which makes it uh, transparent, uh, and hopefully you don't notice that there's glass there, but it enables you to shut the door and actually for most of the uh, uses inside and outside to be separated from one another. The, uh, the OBE chapel itself was also completely redecorated and relit with a rather flamboyant kind of lighting scheme, which I thought up about uh, 16 years ago now, but still seems to be sort of all right. Um, and then at the east end, in the OBE chapel, um, uh, there was an extraordinary arrangement whereby this um, uh, eastern part was covered for the floor by um, curling uh, vinyl Mali tiles um, in grey and white. Um, and it wasn't really very satisfactory. We discovered that the reason why they were there is because there's a, um, a Victorian mosaic underneath. And clearly at the time they didn't want to, to disturb the Victorian mosaic, despite the fact that they'd actually cut through it to make a new step and cut into it to put Mandel Crichton's great ledger stone, as you see in the foreground. So it took a little bit of persuading um, to actually uh, uh, enable us to lift the uh, mosaic floor while we've got it up in the Triforium, ready to be put down for display purposes, and actually put a completely new marble floor down using the silver grey and the rose colour of, uh, of the order, silver grey Purbeck stone and the rose-coloured Rosso di Verona. Um, and these pick up the materials in Bishop Mandel Crichton's wonderful ledger stone on the left-hand side, which needed a whole lot of uh, conservation after years hidden under a carpet. The business of wear and tear on the floors is, of course, an ongoing issue. And I started many years ago a gradual pro program of assessing ledger stones to establish whether they should be allowed to wear out or whether they recall burials significant enough to merit recutting. And here is one of the few that we decided we would recut. This is Sir Joshua Reynolds in the process of being done. Uh, it was done about uh, 11 or 12 years ago now, and I think it's almost indistinguishable now from, from the other ones around it. I commend it to my successor uh, to see whether the, um, the process of actually uh, continuing occasional recutting shouldn't be followed. 
But Carve the Fabric itself, of course, needs to extend to Carve its historical artifacts and archives. Um, I pointed out yesterday, uh, last week uh, how many uh, wonderful things were scattered um, around various parts of the cathedral. And I was permitted to put down a floor over large areas of the Triforium uh, to create a conservation studio as here. Um, and uh, on the right here, um, an archive store. Uh, on the left is the um, upper side of the vaults and the Triforum as it used to be. And the line of the uh, floor that we put in goes through at about uh, this level here, covers the saucer domes, and allows an, an immense amount of space, as you see on the right-hand side, um, to install the extraordinarily important uh, uh, amount of archives which uh, have been assembled by the cathedral, and which, to my shame, I've added to by an enormous percentage, I'm afraid, with all the stuff that I've produced in my time as surveyor. This, in turn, has made it possible to employ archivists and conservators who, in turn, have been instrumental in bringing in students, as here from the paper conservation course at Camberwell, I think disgracefully closed now, um, giving them uh, useful hands-on experience, as well as providing a great deal of useful work for the cathedral. And now, 20 years on, uh, there's a whole collections team. There's a collections manager, um, there's a librarian, there's an archivist, and a conservator, and they all bring in um, students to help work with them on this essential work of, uh, of understanding and looking after the archives of various kinds. Finally, and very briefly, because we're out of time, um, a brief review of the setting over the last 20 years. Um, the Paternoster scheme of William Holford, um, I talked about last week, uh, a replacement to it uh, was uh, the form was um, uh, arranged by a competition uh, which was run in the 1980s and which was run won by Arabs uh, in 1987. Um, but for good or bad, it was uh, set aside in favour of John Simpson and Terry Farrell's luckily unbuildable scheme. Um, which would have effectively cut the cathedral and its chapter house out of the new Paternoster Square. And if I compare you with um, that, with what has been built there now, you can probably see that this space is actually a nasty trick because all the people have been made about three quarters full size to make the space look substantially bigger than it would have actually been. Luckily, the planners tumbled to that and other aspects of the scheme, which made them feel that perhaps it was not to be followed. And William Whitfield was appointed to act as master planner for the uh, Pat Paternoster scheme as executed um, in the late 90s and first part of this century. Uh, this uh, arrangement does at least allow the cathedral to, uh, itself to dominate and it allows the chapter house to remain as an important part of the square and it's enabled Temple Bar to at last be brought back. And it's also enabled um, great vistas of the cathedral to be opened up which follow the original 17th century and indeed earlier street patterns uh, blocked by the Holford scheme as here this favourite view of mine uh, down Cannon Alley on the north transept. The march of progress, of course, continues. The planners of the City of London have generally been good friends to the cathedral and have striven to ensure that the cluster of towers which, with which they've been greatly preoccupied over the past 20 years doesn't overwhelm the most important views of the cathedral uh, from the key points. All of those buildings uh, that are shown in this uh, have now been consented and, as you will see, some of them have already been constructed. The city, as I say, have, have been uh, sensitive to the cathedral and its position on the skyline and sensitive of the need to, to plan it. Uh, but that um, sensitivity doesn't uh, extend, of course, when, when you ratchet it all up a scale or two, because outside the city of London, other boroughs um, are not so conscious of St Paul's Cathedral at the centre of the city. Um, and probably the borough of Southwark hardly noticed that actually this was going to be the impact of the shard on the cathedral in important protected views from Parliament Hill Fields. 
Um, so the pressures remain. I uh, appeared for the cathedral at the public inquiry into the shard uh, to object to it on the principle of scale, making the point that the scale of the shard as, as erected would completely dwarf uh, the scale of the cathedral itself. In the inspector's report, he didn't use the word scale once. Um, that's developers for you. Um, but it's the story of, the real story of the last 20 years is the story of the changes to the building itself. Um, and I admit that they have been fairly radical. And it's possible that they extend to more parts of the cathedral and indeed to more parts of its mission than those made in any other similar period in its history since the building was completed 300 years ago. My hope is that these new interventions will slip gently and imperceptibly into history, um, but only time will tell. Thank you. For all information, please go to www.gresham.ac.uk.